Hello, welcome. Tanse, miau kisigal. It is a beautiful day. Sigason Jacqueline. Westwood respectfully acknowledges that we are gathered today on Treaty 6 land, a land that is rich in history, some small part of it being the history of settlers who've lived and worked here, and most of it being in the hearts and minds of the Indigenous peoples who have inhabited and stewarded this land through countless centuries, countless millennia. This is and has been a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Blackfoot, Iroquois, Dene, Anishinaabe, Nakota Sioux, Inuit, Métis, and in particular, the people of the Papas Chase Nation. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us, and the youth who inspire us. We're all treaty people, no matter how short or long our relationship with this land has been. As treaty people, we must be responsible for the continued stewardship of this land and for living in right relation and reciprocity with the peoples of this land. We're a part of the legacy of this land which we inhabit, which waits to be inhabited by our descendants. We're gathered today to learn more about the land upon which we walk. And it is through learning that we may discover what is right action for us and how to be in right relationship with our Indigenous cousins. May this acknowledgement lead us to a way of living, a way of thinking, a way of being in right relationship, and be the jumping off point for respectful learning. This acknowledgement is a reminder to me of the responsibility I carry as an individual as I live my life from day to day, and a reminder to continue to learn about my relationship with its peoples and the land where I live, work, and play. Welcome everyone, it's a delightful to see you here. All the right people are here in my mind. Uh, my name is Sarah and Jacqueline and I are two of a Westwood Reconciliation Group hosting you today. And we bid all of you a Westwood welcome. This will be a hybrid gathering with viewers in person here in the building and online. So a few housekeeping notes particularly for folks in the building. If nature calls, there's an accessible washroom right here, and there are two washrooms downstairs. You can get to them by this hallway or by the far hallway down into the basement. Your hosts encourage all of you to sample the sweets and uh, drinks and refresh yourself. So feel free if during the presentation you'd like to have a cookie or some uh, decaf or some coffee or some tea, it's all waiting for you at the back. This session will be recorded and it will be available on YouTube in a few days. And now to our well regarded and recommended speaker, Dylan Reed. Dylan has decades of experience in freelance camera work, including extensive experience with all IMAX 2D and 3D cameras, specializing in 3D camera operations and stereography. A significant reason for how Dylan landed here today is his digging deep as the writer and producer of the video series celebrating the history and diversity of the UNESCO designated Beaver Hills biosphere. So Westwood's speaker series, this, this series beyond land acknowledgement, it began with curiosity about the land Westwood occupies and its unknown history. Now following uh, Dylan's presentation, there will be time for online and live questions and curiosities. 
And I'm going to ask anyone in the building who has that, and we'll bring we'll bring the mic to you to speak to the mic. It is a uh, an act of respect for folks who are challenged with hearing, and for our viewers online. They need to hear that sound through the microphone. Over to you, Dylan. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Dylan Reed. I, I uh, worked 40 years in the film industry now, coming up next year. Uh, 33 decades of that was spent uh, as my next cameraman. I worked in all seven continents. I got to work with a lot of different people and cultures around the world. Uh, I want to thank you, Sarah, for the introduction and also, Jack also Jacqueline for the um, customized uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, we often hear the formula is red, so it's nice to hear one that's very personal like that. Um, and I, a lot of what my presentation of today is about is um, an augmentation of that, moving from a general land acknowledgement to a very specific land acknowledgement and understanding um, a story that exists beneath the surface indexes that we go to, like the homestead records or the surface maps and narratives like the river lot narrative, and understanding that there's an older story with much older families, and more importantly, that it can be largely reconstructed to the point that we can put specific families back into their proper places on the map. And uh, it's, you know, it's a great coincidence that I've been invited to speak at the Westwood Unitarian Church um, because I've done seven or eight presentations uh, on this subject before, and I always start right here. There are two quarter sections side by side, which I always felt um, exemplified or illustrated better than any other place um, what it is that we're missing about this story and how to um, how to use it as an example to show that we can reconstruct not just an earlier story for Park Allen, but all the surrounding neighborhoods, the river lot settlements, and really the whole province of Alberta. Um, so before I get started, I, I also wanted to mention that this is my third time in my life that I've uh, entered a Unitarian church, aside from the, the sound check that I did a few days ago with Elaine and Lorian. Um, and the first uh, the first time I wanted to, there were two things that, that really stuck with me out of that visit, and I wanted to share the two of them because I, I think they do have relevance for, uh, for my approach to learning more about history and also for the, the subject that we're exploring. So as uh, I guess it was about over a decade ago, uh, I went through a period where I would be working on an IMAX project somewhere internationally, and I thought I would use the opportunity to just drop into congregations of different denominations, hear people's perspectives, learn new things. And I found myself in Los Angeles. I was working on an IMAX 3D film uh, centered on the um, US college football. It was never actually produced. We were there shooting tests and having some preliminary conversations. And there was a Unitarian church uh, not far from where I was staying. And I thought, I'll stop in and see what the Unitarians have to say. And the, uh, you know, it, there was a very compelling sermon that was delivered by the minister. And I'm pretty sure his name was Richard Hoyt McDaniels. I tried to reverse engineer it um, because it, it did leave such an impact on me for a few reasons. And the sermon was entirely anchored on kind of a gory science fiction movie called District 9, which had come out not long before that. And it's, you know, I, I actually, um, in trying to reverse engineer, I, I'm left with the impression of that sermon rather than the content. I tried to reach out to him online, uh, maybe a little bit too late to see if a copy of it existed so that I could refresh my mind. Uh, and I wasn't successful, but I, I thought, uh, where else in the world but Hollywood could you go to a church where the sermon is on a science fiction movie? Um, and then secondly, as I came to understand more about the Unitarian Church, I thought, where else in the world might you hear that other than a Unitarian Church? Um, so the second thing in that, uh, that uh, you know, before or after the sermon, I don't remember, but I was introduced to this concept, which I don't know if it's central to all of Unitarianism or if it was just something that uh, that the minister had come up with. But it was giving this image of the stained glass window as a symbol and that really had an impact on me I've, i really haven't stopped um, thinking about it since and it was talking about religion and the different denominations and different perspectives that everyone in the world is looking through a stained glass window and the catholics are looking through a yellow piece of glass the protestants are looking through a green piece of glass the unitarians are looking through an orange piece of glass atheists are looking through another color um, and, and the point of it was that we're all looking through the window and we each see the world through our own color of glass. And 
that uh, that's what's important is that we're, we're looking and that we understand that we're looking through a piece of glass. And I thought that that was relevant because um, when we talk about looking at history and deconstructing history, I think we have to acknowledge the same thing, that out of a million Edmontonians, there are probably almost as many pieces of glass that we're looking through back at history. And I wanted to start off with that to acknowledge that I understand fully that I'm looking through a single piece of glass and that glass is the color of uh, the archival perspective. I've spent years pouring through archival documents, creating databases, trying to understand structures, and they're literally just that. They're structures. They don't give me any more context to the larger issues, to the, um, you know, the, the displacement, the pain that some families might have felt by being um, broken apart by, by Dominion, Dominion um, policies and uh, the creation of arbit arbitrary categories for people. I can't address any of that, but what I found is a very interesting archival structure that was so important to me to share that it's, I've, I've given a lot of public talks. And so that's, um, that's where we are today. And um, I'm doing this kind of in the, in the opposite uh, direction of every talk that I've given. Typically, uh, I started off with workshops to try to talk about how you piece together these earlier stories. Um, and then I present the information after that. I thought that given, um, you know that this is we're centered on west westwood church and this park allen neighborhood i would start with just showing how we get to the information uh and then if there's time i've got some slides i can run through about some of the ways that uh that that some of the places that that information comes from but uh i'm starting with a uh, a very old glimpse of edmonton this is one of a series of our earliest aerial photographs that uh, that were taken in 1924 so next year it'll be 100 years old um, and this is, you know, essentially where, where we are right now. I think the important thing that I'd like to point out about the large lake, which, um, you know, if the Westwood Unitarian Church had existed 100 years ago, it would have been on a little ridge overlooking the lake. Um, and we see all of these uh, surrounding the lake. We see a little bit of, you know, preliminary uh, town. I, I guess it was the town of Strathcona at that time, or maybe we were amalgamated by then. So there's a little bit of uh, some buildings off to the right. To the left, it's a lot of bush with some uh, remnants of old trails, historical trails that were, uh, they were used by fur traders. Before that, they were moccasin trails. And long before that, they were used by uh, the animals, which is, the, I think, the reason why a lot of trails formed. But 1924 was not so far ahead in time from the fur trade and from the pre-fur trade that those tangible remnants of um, of that earlier community were there. And so we see this trail curving towards uh, what was the, the past and um, at the time future Lake, McCur uh, Lake uh, Lendrum, Lendrum Lake named after a Dominion land surveyor, Robert Lendrum. Um, and that trail is the old Pigeon Lake Trail. It cut down from here to As what's now Aspen Gardens, cut down through the ravine and then continued uh, off to Pigeon Lake. And that's probably one of our very, very old trails. Um, and in terms of defining our understanding of the city today, we think of it in terms of neighborhoods. And right now we're in the neighborhood of Park Allen. Um, it's a very defined boundary uh, and surrounded by other neighborhoods, uh, the names of which are well known. And, um, and I wanna uh, um, draw these out and have us imprint this idea of the neighborhood as a unit of understanding geography. Um, because we have to move beyond it, but I think it's good to, to keep this underlying footprint in mind. So uh, I'm gonna start with neighborhoods around Park Allen as well, because the story of Park Allen is really interesting, but it's not a distinct story from everything that happens around it. It's all of these neighborhoods have a story which is interlaced and interlaced not only in this area, but throughout the whole Edmonton district, um, because the Edmonton district was a stage that had a lot of interplay between families and relationships um, and a certain component of them came together here. The two lakes uh, don't exist anymore. We have what was Lendrum Lake here, just north of the, the Unitarian Church, uh, and then the larger McKernan Lake uh, in today's McKernan neighborhood. Um, both of them were drained, I guess, to, uh, to make more land for, for more town lots. Um, and I understand, uh, speaking with Lorian the other day, that sometimes you have uh, Lendrum Lake likes to make a reappearance by flooding certain certain years, certain times of the year. 
So the uh, Queen Alexandra neighborhood, some people will be surprised to learn that Queen Alexandra of Denmark never actually lived in the neighborhood that bears her name. <laughs> a few more people might be surprised to learn that the Dominion Land Surveyor Robert Lendrum never lived anywhere near what was called Lendrum Lake. And in fact, I don't think he lived in the neighborhood called Lendrum Place. And I think most people will be surprised that Robert McKernan, after who the large lake in the entire neighborhood is named, also never uh, occupied any of that land. And the, this deconstruction process, understanding, um, you know, I, I think these are remnants of early town planners in their attempt to commemorate neighborhoods. I think it really illustrates how poorly served we are by the names uh, which we've used to, to commemorate history. They take us to a certain um, point in time, uh, as we'll find out, they're not actually accurate in, in a lot of cases. And we have a lot of old, um, Edmonton was originally set up with street names rather than the numbers that we have now. Those were changed, I think, around 1912, 1914. And a lot of the early street names bore the names of Métis families predominantly, Hardesty, Fraser. Um, I think we have one surviving, Roland. Uh, and in this neighborhood, there was one called Irvine Street. And Irvine is about the closest that we get to actually having a credible connection to, to the earliest families that were here. And I'll get to that shortly. So um, I also wanted to point out that immediately west of the Unitarian Church, we, what we see is farmland. Um, we see remnants of more trails uh, dotted here and there along the, the edge of the, um, the ravine. This will be the ravine that drops off down towards Fort Edmonton. And, uh, and old maps and old, old aerial photographs are great in that they do preserve a lot of these hints of older trails. Uh, the other thing is we have a lot of farmland here laid out in squares. Obviously, it was still being farmed at the time. But interestingly, some really strange shaped farms uh, off to the left, more trapezoidal, um, irregular patterns. And I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind as well. So uh, widening out. Now, like, continue to think about this idea of neighborhoods and the shapes of neighborhoods as the kernels of understanding of how the modern city is laid out. Um, I want to start defining those relative to older units. Uh, one of them was a historical entity that was known at the time as Edmonton Settlement. It started as a farming village. It evolved over time. Um, and it was laid out in uh, what were called river lots, these elongated strips that stretch back from the river based on a French system. Today's University Avenue, that strange diagonal uh, that intersects all of our straight lines, that was the southern boundary of the river lots, and that's why um, that, that's why it exists in that sense. The river lots followed the shape of the river. Everyone got, I think, uh, a mile back from the river frontage, and so the, as the river slopes up above that, the lots would slope up as well. We can also understand these neighborhoods in terms of the former Pappas Chase Preserve. Um, which was very large compared to Edmonton Settlement. Uh, when I first uh, started, when the Papas Chase Reserve was first coming on my radar, I think it was around the time of the, uh, the activism around the Fort Edmonton burial ground, um, many years ago now. But I had in my mind that it was kind of Mill Woods, and I think a lot of people maybe still have that, not understanding that the Papas Chase Reserve represented a good portion of the entirety of South Edmonton. Um, and it's... Uh, it's distinct from any other, um, we have this township system where the Dominion Land Surveyors came in, into town, laid out a grid, squares, quarter sections. The reserves didn't fit into that grid. Sometimes the reserves like the Papas Chase Reserve were square, but it was like a square peg into a smaller square hole. It doesn't actually conform with the same township system which the homestead records were, were laid out on. Uh, and nor obviously do the river lots conform, they were based on um, on how the river was sloped. So today, the, the information that I want to share covers all of these neighborhoods. I've added a few more in Aspen Gardens, where I live, Westbrook Estates, um, and some others dotted in that northwest corner of the former Papas Chase Reserve. Um, I have to remember why I'm zooming in here. I put, uh, I put these slides together. Oh, yes. Um, and straddling the, uh, the, pot, the former Papas Chase Reserve uh, and that area south of the, the, the river lots, um, there's a strong 
archival support uh, to show to demonstrate that, that this was kind of a center of gravity of the Papas Chase band for a period of time. Um, the, the Papas Chase Reserve was also called uh, in records the Two Hills Reserve, and the Two Hills were what we now call Mount Pleasant Cemetery and Huntington Hill, which I've highlighted there in kind of a sloppy blotch of orange color. Um, those hills were uh, adjacent to what were called the two lakes. On this map, the larger one is called the Two Hills Lake. Like Lendrum and McKernan Lake, these ones no longer exist. They were drained, uh, one of them actually by our carpenter, John Walter, who had bought uh, some property. Um, and I guess the same reason, probably to clear the way for more town lots to be sub subdivided at, uh, at some point. But the two hills, um, the two hills were significant and, um, and just understand that the reserve, Northern Reserve boundary is kind of cutting through the two of them. And widening up to, um, to a broader view, we also bring in the, uh, the Enoch Nation Reserve to the west of Edmonton. And you can see the relative size of, of the reserves to, um, to the size of Edmonton settlement as it was known at that time. We know a lot about the river lots. It's kind of the founding narrative of Edmonton is based on the river lots. There's a certain amount of information that we know about the, the reserves, a lot of um, Indian department records from which some of those stories can be reconstructed. But the black area in between tends to get left out of, uh, of our understanding of early history. And it's that area, uh, and particularly the area of our neighborhoods here um, that I wanna be addressing as a microcosm to a larger story that, uh, that repeats itself across the board. And I should also say, I mentioned District 9, and uh, the reason I wanted to trace my way back to the, the survey, it's a science fiction film about these insect-like aliens who they're sick and their ship kind of shows up one day hovering over, up over top of Johannesburg. And they're there for a long time, people are worried about them, and then finally the ship is opened up, they find all these sick insect creatures that they call prawns derogatorily, and then they incarcerate them into these um, camps. District 9 was one of the camps that they're all rounded up into. And the point of the sermon, uh, as best as I re recollect it, was talking about um, an underlying message in that film that aligned completely with the Unitarian perspectives. Uh, it, uh, it's a film that explores, you know, on the surface, it's an alien movie, but beneath the subtext, it's exploring uh, apartheid. I mean, it's, a, it's a pretty obvious. And through apartheid, it's exploring themes of xenophobia, racism, segregation, and this whole idea of putting this alien race into compounds where they're not allowed to leave, essentially. And I think there's a, you know, I think it's relevant because there are a lot of parallels in that sermon. I hope maybe there's a there's a way of making contact and then pulling it out that just talked about the the, the humanity in that film, which you wouldn't normally think about in a in a gory science fiction movie, but. You know, there, there is, I think there, there are threads that um, we look at apartheid and we look at what happened here. Um, the Dominion Land Survey maps, uh, which I've kind of added in underneath now, the, the grid with the numbers across it, they add in more information uh, for us with these map, these trail fragments, which a lot of times then intersect and give you an aha to the pieces of trail that you see in the aerial maps. Uh, and from that, we can see that the Unitarian Church uh, Westwood Unitarian Church is kind of a, the confluence of quite a few old important trails, Pigeon Lake Trail, the old Calgary Trail, which used to be much further west than it is now, and it was never straight, it was kind of a curvy spot, uh, and then the Hay Lakes Trail, which went down to the, um, it, it led to a part of the traditional hunting grounds of the Papas Chase Band, as I understand from, um, from one of Frank Oliver's articles, but it was also the ultimate end of the telegraph line. The telegraph was built by people like Robert McKernan, who then thought, hey, I like the looks of Edmonton here. Um, and so this lake, Lendrum Lake, uh, it's convenient not only because uh, people would settle around these lakes because it was access to water, obviously for their livestock, it was access to hay marshes, uh, which was important for the cattle, but the spot that the church stands on was also obviously important for access to transportation. And so because it had satisfied all of those elements, it was desirable as one of those early places that people might um, think about establishing a farm when that time came. Uh, 
Yeah, so the um, in that old township grid, uh, we have what uh, we, we in that vernacular was called sections 19 and 20 in a township numbered 5224. And I had mentioned that all of the presentations that I've given have been centered on these two sections because what they reveal is uh, a very universal message across the board. And here uh, we can demonstrate how Robert McKernan, his farm was not McKernan neighborhood in modern day Edmonton, it was Belgravia. He would have had a really nice view um, overlapping into um, the University of Alberta's southern campus. And um, part of what is now Park Allen was the uh, Victor Anderson, the son of our Crown Timber agent, who had quite a bit of land in Strathcona. Uh, and then there's a name right underneath Westwood Church, John it's misspelled on this map, as many names are, that his name was John Ashen. And so now we start to see how the neighborhoods fit into the old Dominion land, sur uh, land survey grid, uh, the quarter sections. Can you take a question? Yes, I'll take a question. On that map, can you tell me where something that you know today, so I'm going to say the Calgary Trail or what Street yeah. there? Yeah. Um, and repeat the questions yeah, uh, the question is identifying something on this map which we can uh, we can associate to to today, uh, and I think I've got a better wider map if I if I can come back to them, or maybe I, I need to go backwards in time to get there. It's just hard to read. Yeah. In, uh, the text and the lines. That's oh. Yeah, okay. Well, you know what? The, um, that diagonal road, the, the, uh, the southern boundary of the river lots, that's 76th Avenue now. Um, I guess thinking in terms of neighborhoods. Yes. Uh, no, this is not. No, this is, this is north of the Papas Chase Reserve. Um, but, you know, I guess the, uh, we have the railroad track that runs along the new Calgary Trail. Um, Old Calgary Trail was more 111th Street. No, 106th. Um, what, what street are we at? Cross Street are we on here? 109th. Yeah, so it's about 106th, 107th. I'm sorry. I um, I probably. Trying to give me a microphone. Okay. Thank you. It just helps to sort of overlay in my head. It's what we've called um, reverse engineering. Yeah. So I'm trying to do the same thing. I will try to point out a few more features when I have maps that, um, that demonstrate it better. But I, the key thing is Unitarian Church, right, uh, right in the middle. Um, the outside, like this would be modern, uh, modern Gateway Boulevard on the west side. Uh, and then on the east side, uh, Grandview Heights, which is just south of the University Farm, the North Saskatchewan River. Um, I'll try to point out a few more features. Um, so I've widened out here now to, I, uh, I've done a lot of work with the Beaver Hills biosphere the last few years. Uh, and I have a, a four or five minute clip from, um, from one of the last films that I did for them, which does feature uh, one of your next speakers, Chief Darlene Messick is here today. Um, you know what, maybe I, I wanted, uh, I, I had meant to set up your next two speakers in the opening, uh, opening slide. I kind of got ahead of myself, but um, there was a moment in time that all three of us came together. I, I had met Miranda Jimmy six or seven years ago. She was doing work uh, with the Edmonton Heritage Council, and they introduced me to her, and we've conversed on and off. I understand that members of the Westwood congregation had, had helped her in her political campaign, um, and I was at the... Um, the Treaty 6 statue unveiling this past summer. And Miranda, I hadn't seen her for quite some time, and she came up to me and had a mask on, so I didn't recognize her initially, but she just wanted to catch up and say hi. And the point that she caught up with me, I was at Chief Missick's tent with uh, much of her council was there that day. And I don't remember if I introduced you to her or, uh, or what the, the circumstances were, but we were all there uh, together. So. Um, Chief Missick, I connected with through the Beaver Hills work. Actually, you know, I'll save that anecdote for just before the, um, the film. I'll, I'll try to stay on message here. 
Um, so the Beaver Hills gave me this opportunity to reconstruct this Dominion land survey map of 77 townships um, out of 77 separate maps that were drawn. And I matched everything up. I uh, applied some real world topography to it so that you can see where the, the rivers are and the hills make more sense. And sometimes that makes helps you understand why trails are where they are. And um, this represents the, the extent of the, the land-based deconstruction that I've done. It's 77 townships ranging from um, the Michelle Reserve in St. Albert on the west to Beaver Hills Lake on the east. Um, it includes all of Edmonton, St. Albert, and Fort Saskatchewan settlements. It includes three reserves. And, and it's, it's, I had started off um, trying to deconstruct 12 townships that included St. Albert, Edmonton, and Fort Saskatchewan. And because of the work with the Beaver Hills biosphere, I expanded that to the 77. Yes. Monistic. Yeah. The question was asking me to point out where Monistic uh, Bird Sanctuary is. Um, so the, I mean, the Beaver Hills represents a good, uh, Edmonton is here, St. Albert, and pretty much everything uh, uh, east of Edmonton is the Beaver Hills, and I'll, I will talk a little more about the biosphere. Um, and this has kind of been the sphere of my, my deconstruction, and it's these two, um, well, it's a, a, the township is, as an historical unit, um, it's, it's kind of the coarse unit that the West was carved up into. And we might even think of this as the colonization grid. It was a, uh, it was a means of carving the West up into squares that could be easily rationalized by bureaucrats. Um, if everything had a numerical designation, then they could understand and build the records around that. Every township was six miles by six miles, 36 square miles. And so it becomes really easy looking at these maps to estimate distances, you know, oh, it takes six miles to walk across, or it's six miles to walk across that township. Um, and every township is divided into exactly 36 sections. Um, every section is a one mile by one mile square. And every section was divided into four quarter sections, and a quarter section was a typical homestead claim. Um, somebody might apply to get a homestead claim, they would take out one quarter section as a homestead, and then a second quarter section as a preemption, which meant that they could pay and, and, uh, and have half a section. Every quarter section was 160 acres, and every quarter section was, or every section was further subdivided into 16 separate units, discrete units called legal subdivisions or LSDs. And why this becomes very helpful in trying to deconstruct earlier land is that every one of these partitions and subpartitions became a potential source of records uh, generated by the Dominion Lands Department. And so it also becomes an extremely easy way to organize information. I was very haphazard when I started um, initially trying to understand, I thought the river lot narrative, and then when the river lot narrative pointed me outside of that, um, so every uh, township, I mean, the, the, the entire grid, the entire Northwest mostly was divided up into these, these grids. And everyone had a numerical designation based on township and range. If you've been out driving in the country, you see township road number 220. If you wonder what that is, it's the townships where the line going from south to north, the ranges were going from east to west. Um, and you know, what's, what's really striking about this approach to carving up the land is that it was completely um, oblivious to the natural underlying landscape. The, the lines cut through lakes, rivers, um, farms that existed uh, in, some, in a lot of instances, including here, um, the John Ashen farm, which straddles Park Allen and Allendale, was right down through the middle. Um, and in, you know, as I was starting with that original 12 township, uh, deconstruction, I just found 5224 to be such a compelling place to start. 5224 is the, the one that we're situated in right now. And it was compelling because it had so many different units in it. It had the townships, it had Edmonton settlement, the river lots, uh, and then it had the Pappas Chase Reserve on the south, and then quite a few others in between. It turns out that the, um, uh, if, if we can get to it in the, the, my later slides, uh, the, 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 
if we go to the homestead records uh, and the, the Western Canada Land Grants Index and look at that as a starting point to understand how the land was distributed, that represents such a tiny portion. Uh, there were so many other different sources that uh, the different places that the land was uh, was allotted. And so it requires a lot of different databases and it's the fusion of those databases that helps to, to create that bigger picture. So what that means in terms of our local story, Uh, oh, I wanted to just uh, highlighting highlighting the farms again. These uh, these strange shapes that um, that don't fit into any grid. Um, I I would have been blind to this a few years ago, but I have I've had the pleasure of collaborating on a number of projects with Matt Hilterman, a Métis ethno historian, currently an interpreter at uh, Calgary's Heritage Park, previously at Fort Edmonton, and he's one of those many people like Chief Misick and uh, and Miranda, your next speakers, who on occasion have nudged me over to have a look through their color of glass and, and understand that there's there are different ways of looking at things and Matt pointed out on our beaver hills work that you know obviously these strange shapes adjoining water white mud creek uh, at the bottom north saskatchewan river obviously there was somebody there who thought that they had river lots and they're not part of the river lot narrative but the shape of the farms betray that and we see that places like beaver hills lake we see pla that places like Long Lake, an, an old lake that used to stand between Edmonton and St. Albert. And I just, uh, I, I thought it was worthwhile to point out because it, it is suggestive that there's another story there that predated the township grid. Um, so John Ashen, um, John Ashen was not the first person to, to farm at what is now Park Allen and what, uh, you know, immediately south of uh, Westwood Unitarian Church, straddling between Park Allen and Allendale. But he's a good place to start because I think he's he represents um, what's significant about the relationships uh, in this area. And if I widen out um, and bring in three other families just to the east, I can speed this up. Um, so we have some Scotsmen, uh, the three Johns, John Ashen, John Irvine, and John Shields, and then William Maver or Meaver. And uh, we, can, we can start thinking about kinship between people. These are all uh, son-in-laws of William Maver. Um, William Maver was a, a very old Hudson's Bay Company employee. I think he was originally at York Factory. Uh, he was in Edmonton at least from the 1860s, and his comings and goings are quite well detailed in the Fort Edmonton Post Journals. He seemed to have his hands in a lot of things from freighting to carpentering to running errands. Um, and he's well documented, but if, if we just look at these names that are on the map, then we are, you know, going past these names and going to their wives are a good starting point to understand what's actually happening. Uh, and I, did, I mentioned that uh, the Irvine district, which is also part of what we call CPR South, it's that area where the arches are on Gateway Boulevard, just as you're about to enter uh, to White, White Avenue, that was uh, Irvine. Um, William Maver was married to a sister of Chief Papa's Chase, Jean Gladue, and the three other Johns are all married to her daughters. So these are, uh, these are nieces of Chief Papa's Chase and his sister, and notably they're outside of the reserve boundaries. So it starts to paint in this picture of something else that's uh, that's there that we've been we've been missing. If we start adding in uh, Allendale, oh no, I'm going to step back and uh, Jean Gladue. It might have looked like a Union Jack um, flag beside her. It's not. It's the Treaty Six flag, and I put this in because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to clarify that. Um, and, and also to address, when I get back to talking about this archival lens and the things that I can't possibly weigh in on, I have no perspective on this, the, the subject of self-identification, which I think is really complex. We have to remember that it was the Dominion government that expected people to take treaty or to take script and identify themselves as Métis. And the more people that I meet from these communities and, and, and discuss this, the more I understand the complexities around people having been forced to choose an arbitrary category. Um, and in, I think the story of South Edmonton is one of those instances where we can see that it, it, it had the actual outcome of breaking apart families. Because once you've chosen treaty, you're expected in a lot of cases to be in the, on a reserve. If you've chosen script, you're this free agent like the settlers. 
uh, but there's it, it's not it's not a fine line. There are families where some made one choice, some made another, and so I can't weigh in on any of that. I, I'm using these tags for convenience. I've, I'm giving someone a treaty tag if they took treaty at some point. A lot of people who took, took treaty would then subsequently withdraw and take script. A lot of people who have Cree French ethnicity or Cree Scottish ethnicity, there are some who never took script and never identified as Métis. And so I can't distinguish between any of that. It gets back to just being able to look at things through uh, this archival um, colored glass. And so if there are um, errors that I've made, I mean, I, this is just for de depicting um, for graphic purposes to demonstrate uh, that these are not European settlers. Some other flags I use, the Dominion of Canada flag, the first one at the bottom, rather than the modern flag, uh, Scottish, English, American, and uh, there's, uh, there's one Irish um, man in there as well. So uh, adding in uh, further in the middle, uh, we find entire families of Treaty 6 uh, living outside of the reserve. And in this case, these are all uh, first cousins of Chief Papas Chase. They're the daughters of his, his aunt, Nakowin, um, who was probably living with them as well. I put her there because based on every other pattern, there seems to be always be a pre-matriarch at center. And she was a member of, I believe, the Edmonton Stragglers. She might have been Papa's Chase, I, I don't remember. Uh, Nakowin, it's uh, Lizette's sister. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, you know, up at the top of Allendale, um, even older families, families that go back to the beginning of our records uh, and the fur trade, uh, the Ward family. William Ward Sr. was, or the original Ward was out here uh, in the seven, 1790s as a horseman for the Northwest Company before the Hudson's Bay Company even had a presence. Um, his family then went on to be multi-generational horse guard um, employees of the Hudson's Bay Company. The horse guard was one of the main things that kept the employees of Fort Edmonton alive. Uh, they, they brought wood in to, to create buildings. They brought um, uh, buffalo meat in from the plains they were you couldn't live without the horses so the wards were very important and william ward senior was married to a daughter of chief joseph lapatak uh, from the beaver hills cree who um the fort edmonton post journals when he died and buried him at the fort edmonton burial ground eulogized him as their most important chief uh I, they, well, sorry, I'm sorry, Beaver Hills, I should say there's uh, there was a place called the Beaver Mountain, and there was a period in history that um, that there was a, an accumulation. I'll, I'll let you ask a question for the mic so that people can hear it. Tommy, Tommy was part of a, a, a larger band called the Tail Creek Indians, and they were from the southern Buffalo Lake area. So he came up here and married into the into the families that were here already. Right, just same, just same like Papa's chase. This is this is traditional that people had to marry within the families that were already here. So Papa's chase was a very late comer to this area, very late. And uh, this is a story that a lot of people don't want to understand or, or under, uh, to to um, comprehend this. Um, if truth all be told, uh, Tommy's father was actually white. So there was a lot of intermarriage within within uh, within the fur trade itself. Are you Gerald? Yeah. I didn't recognize you. It's been a few years. Yeah. So I've done we've done quite a bit of extensive research, a lot further back than than what is the, the narrative today. So there is some very interesting uh, research has been done. Actually, the the Calgary Trail was actually the Bow Trail at one time, right? Because it came up from the Bow River and back and forth. And the why there was very few trees around here because the Hudson's Bay was allowed to 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 log out fifty square miles around Edmonton. So this is where all your railway ties come in and your houses come in and stuff like this. So. So there is a large, much larger band, and I have been representing the, what they call the Empton Stragglers, which was the biggest band in the Empton region at that time. And when, when the uh, government of the day started breaking this band up, 
Many went to Papa Shays, many went to, to Enoch, Alexander, but the core of the people that were here, this is where they went, came from. Because Papa Shays didn't come down with 180 people. They all stem from the Edmonton area. I'm glad you're here, Gerald, and I'd like to talk to you afterwards. I think there okay. are, you know, things have stocked up since. Uh, oh yeah, and there's a lot week. more, a lot, tons more. Thanks. Um, and so just flushing in the rest of the neighborhoods, uh, it gets us to um, understanding that there were Métis and Treaty 6 and blends of those two, uh, really all the way down Pigeon Lake Trail, all the way down um, White Mud Creek, uh, as far as Westbrook Estates, and that those families were farming here concurrently, and in some instances, uh, before the river lots were <clears throat> staked out. And, um, and I think that's the, you know, what, what this, this land-based deconstruction has to offer. And all the, this is gonna be really hard to see, I think here or on Zoom, I do have some, some closer views that I, that I can come back to briefly, but essentially it's this whole um, uh, overlooked story of, of early Edmonton. And it does, a large part of the story, Gerald, is the Edmonton stragglers. And what this does ultimately is to allow us to map those stragglers out into position on, on their land here, St. Albert, Fort Saskatchewan. Um, and, and then just understand that the treaty footprint is much larger than looking at it, just thinking that we had have and had these reserves. Why do you call the stragglers? Because they didn't recognize the chiefs that came here. Yes. They weren't from this territory. That's the reason. The Edmonton stragglers, the stragglers didn't recognize the chiefs that came here because they were not from this area. They weren't from traditionally from this area. That's why the, the um, government of the day made the Edmonton stragglers because they were chopping up the bands already. And we knew who our chiefs were and they weren't the ones that they picked out for us. Imagine that. And it's, uh, it's helpful to, uh, to have that pointed out because it gets back to what I'm saying that all I can look at is the archival lens. That's, that's all that I have to offer. And there are, it does open the door to a lot broader um, discussions. And I, I agree with you that the stragglers have been misrepresented. Um, but on the other hand, we are now... We do have now members of the Empton Stragglers Band that's recreated through INAC. Okay. Um, how's my time? Left. Okay. Uh, it, not including dis uh, not including discussion. Okay. Um, so I, I just wanted to take a, a brief um, uh, pause uh, and run a short clip from uh, some of the work that I've done for the Beaver Hills Biosphere. Uh, I think this clip is four or five minutes, and it features. Um, the first opportunity that I had really to start trying to take some of this archival data and find a way to um, bring it alive with with actual stories. Um, the you know Beaver Hills Biosphere were very generous in giving me free license to try to come up with stories that I felt were, were interesting, and it led me to um, to a story that that's never been told before about Joseph Tyrrell, the paleontologist uh, who the Dinosaur Museum in Drumheller is uh, is named after. All of his biographies cover his early years with the um, Canadian Geological Survey, uh, his famous discovery of dinosaur bones that put his name on the map and kind of earned the wrath of his, uh, the leader of his group. Uh, and, and then they cut to, the, to uh, the future when he had adventures up in the Klondike, he was involved with mining, but they all overlook this pivotal expedition, six month long expedition that he came to Fort Edmonton in 1886. And in that he, you know, he leaves us the most detailed information that we have about the Beaver Hills. He, he gives us clues to an older story of the Beaver Hills. And significantly, he has major interactions with Chief Papas Chase and his brothers. Uh, he initially shows up uh, looking for a guide to take him through the Beaver Hills. 
he's told by Chief Factor Hardesty and people in the village that there was nobody else in the area at that time who had ever been in the Beaver Hills except for Papas Jason and his brothers. And so Joseph Tyrrell caught up to the chief at Fort Edmonton, followed him out to the Two Hills camp. They had only just withdrawn from treaty weeks earlier, and so they were in a great state of upheaval. He tried to engage them unsuccessfully, went into the Beaver Hills, got lost before he could even find the trail, went back to Chief Papas Chase, who then led him to the trail head and drew him a map in the second last page of his field book. And that map is of great historical significance in that it's the first to label a lot of features within the Beaver Hills that weren't even identified on later maps. And even more consequentially, it defines a trail which was never surveyed and portions, large portions of which are still intact into the 21st century. So I, I thought it was a very significant story, uh, but I felt I couldn't tell it without connecting with descendants who, who I could talk to about this story. And so an archaeologist friend of mine told me that he knew a great grandson of Chief Papas Chase, George Quinn, who is here today. Um, he connected us. I called George and he was very supportive and enthusiastic from the beginning. He told me I had to talk to Darlene Missick, who was also descended from one of the brothers of Chief Papas Chase. Um, and I received a call from her when I was at Monistic Lake uh, scouting an island that Joseph Tyrrell uh, identified as being very consequential. I received a call from her while I was on that island and we just um, we had a lot of communication and a very positive dialogue that led up to their involvement in this uh, this episode. So a fairly short uh, excerpt, but just to to show how you start taking some of this archival information, um, which is essentially just a structural template, find how it can bring context to the stories of people and their families and, and help to bring it alive. And, and I hope make history more interesting in the process. This is about I don't know, 10 minutes into the video. Uh, but you can see this at beaverhills.ca. There are nine films. Um, several of them are, uh, are built around this idea of earlier land deconstruction, and they do point um, and identify some centers of gravity of a, a number of stories that, um, that come to the surface through this approach. So I apologize for that. No, you know, it's, um, it'll, it'll give more time for questions and uh, it's all online at, uh, at the Beaver Hills. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Beaver Hills Biosphere, it's a UNESCO designated biosphere. It's a very large area uh, just east of Edmonton, starts essentially at Sherwood Park, uh, includes all of Elk Island Park, Monistic Lake, Nicolon Lake to the south, uh, and just out to the end of the slopes, which stop right before Beaver Hill Lake near Toefield. So it's a large area. It received a designation um, over a decade ago now. Uh, they've been working hard to make more people aware and to, uh, they have a very, um, uh, they they've, they've ha have an indigenous outreach program where they're trying to find people and ancestors and, and reconnect them to the land. So I think it's a very worthwhile uh, organization. Uh, I produced nine films for them in 2021 and another two this year coming up. Um, and I strongly encourage you to, to check out their website. Um, oh yeah, they, so these are the slides uh, that uh, just give us a little bit of a closer view. I hope that anybody on Zoom is able to see them. But what we have um, filling the entire gap between the Northern Boundary and the Papas Chase Reserve and the southern boundary of Edmonton settlement are these families, largely Edmonton stragglers, a lot of them direct nieces, cousins of Chief Papas Chase. Um, and then when we move to, uh, to start following this Pigeon Lake Trail, um, find a lot of older names before Robert McKernan. Uh, and Robert McKernan, in fact, when I say that there, there were earlier people here than John Ashen uh, in Park Allen District, 
John Ashen bought the property from Robert McKernan, who lived here for nine months. He finished the telegraph line. Um, he came to Edmonton, bought it, um, uh, sold it nine months later to John Ashen. And oftentimes you get a detailing through affidavits and statutory declarations. Uh, and this is the, the key way that we find out these older stories. We hear them directly from the people whose names are on the maps. And what we find in this area in South Edmonton, oftentimes there, there's a succession of up to five people who lived on a piece of property before the first person ever got homestead patent. And so when we look at the homestead patents and we look at names like McKernan and Lendrum, we're missing a lot of the picture. Um, and the land-based deconstruction, fusing all of those, those uh, databases together, that's where you start to get the picture. So who did Robert McKernan buy it from? Unfortunately, he identifies that person only as an Indian on his, uh, his homestead application. So, you know, maybe a record, another record will exist that uh, helps us identify who that is. But I think when you look at the familial relationships in that area, which is essentially just north of the two hills, I think we can, we can make some, um, you know, postulate some ideas. Uh, as we go further south, um, that whole belt along Pigeon Lake Trail leading down to Aspen Gardens and Westbrook Estates. A lot of uh, a lot of Métis families and what I didn't uh, didn't really under you know I, I didn't really think about it. I was de just deconstructing in terms of pre French pre Scottish Blackfoot Scottish and it was one of Edmonton's um, urban planners uh, Eric Backstrom uh, last year asked me if I ever saw any indication of Red River history and I said well no but it, I hadn't really been thinking about it and then when I cycled back and looked over it I realized that this is a whole belt of you know largely families that would have had their roots in Red River interestingly in a line down from uh, Lawrence Garneau's river lot Garneau is one of our more famous former Red River settlers but everything extending south of him we have names like uh Whitford, um, Francis Whitford was the first, actually the second homesteader on what's now Grandview Heights. Simon Whitford, I think a brother, was uh, the first homesteader at Westbrook Estates. Norman Vandell, Aspen Gardens. His wife, Julie Monroe, um, Blackfoot descent. Uh, and and so there's, there's some connection there. A lot of these names are the families that followed Reverend George McDougall to Victoria Settlement in the 1860s. Um, and then a very old name uh, in what's today Bullier Heights, Daniel. And Daniel goes back to um, there, at who actually Chief Mizzick also descends from, uh, goes back to uh, a birth at the first Fort Edmonton. So that, that family has been around a long time. I think the French Cree family. Um, his son, David, uh, both of them feature in the Fort Edmonton Post journals. There's a lot of reference of their day-to-day -day labors. Uh, David was originally in the vicinity of Bonnie Dune. I think it was Strathern Drive. He had a claim that was contested by uh, one of the early merchants, and the Dominion Lands Department weighed in that uh, that he had more right to it than anybody because he had been around the longest. But for whatever reason, he took out a claim here. Um, a lot of these families, you find people who are in treaty in them. Sometimes it's an adopted orphan from probably the smallpox epidemic, like in the Vandal family. Um, you find families who took treaty and then withdrew families where some kids are in treaty. And again, Gerald, a lot of them are Edmonton stragglers. And that's, that's, um, that's why I'd like to talk more with you. Um, but ultimately in this process, it becomes possible to, I'm going to wrap up right now then. Um, I'm just going to skip over a couple of slides here. Um, Actually, that, no, that one I do want to get to. I'm, uh, I'll wrap up in less than five minutes, I think. But um, And then we, we look uh, further back in time to even older stories. Um, some of the names that, uh, that we look at in these Park Allen and adjacent neighborhoods, William Maver, John Ashen, uh, the Wards, George Kipling, most of them stragglers, uh, but most of them also related to Chief Papas Jay. So we find that several years earlier they were the earlier river lot settlers whose names aren't on the maps because the uh the patents weren't granted until after that and the the photograph is of joseph mcdonald who's considered the founder of strathcona um river lot 11. uh blackfoot descent his wife uh, is french Cree. Uh, sorry scottish Cree. she's one of the daughters of the famous bagpiper 
uh, Colin Fraser, Joseph McDonald, um, in an interview late in, in his life, uh, said that when he came to this district and took out his homestead claim on this river lot, 1874, that it was occupied by pop people from the Papas Chase Band, and that he personally negotiated with them a quit claim uh, for a gun and horse and other considerations of one mile frontage along the river and one mile back from the river. And if you think in terms of those one mile river lots, section 29 and where the McDonald's boundary is, certainly that included the wards, the Kiplings um, and William Maver. Uh, and then the question is who else on the, the Western part of that reserve, but there's another, you know, it's not in the, the records proper that that's articulated, but in his own personal account. And then again, William Maver, John Ashen, and Joseph McDonald himself have stories that trace back even further in time to a place called Long Lake, which doesn't exist anymore. It was drained in 1912, but they were original settlers there. And a community that grew around Long Lake in the 1860s is one of the biggest missing stories, particularly because uh, they found out in the 1870s to occupy fully a third of the Edmonton River lots. And these are names we normally associate with Highlanders, Warwick, Gullion, Fraser, um, and uh, families that then daughters that intermarried with the Rollins, who were another one of our, our team, our early Métis families. So a lot of missing, um, a lot of fresh information that comes out of this deconstruction. And this is a map of uh, of those treaty and blended treaty families outside of the reserves. So most of the stragglers can be put into position where they lived. And Gerald, I think that includes your um, Pierre Delorme's wife, does it not, in St. Albert? Uh, and it's a story that extends to Fort Saskatchewan and, and beyond this map. And I'm gonna wrap that up. I don't, I'm not gonna get into, uh, I, I, had a, I wasn't sure how long this would take. I had some slides that, demonstrated more uh, the, the how of we get to this information, but I do want to say that it includes maps um, of places that show us exactly where the houses of George Kipling, William Ward, William Maver, and others stood. So the breadth of information which exists to deconstruct this story is significant. Um, and I just want to leave you with the understanding that it can be done. Matt Hilterman has done the same for Calgary using this approach. And I've seen older stories with Battle River, Fort Saskatchewan, Lac La Biche, and at some point, I'd love to see the whole province deconstructed, but I'm not moving outside the 77 townships. So um, I would uh, I'd, I'll welcome all questions and comments. Excuse me, but we're going, to, we're going to have a time for questions, and we're going to make sure that everybody that asks a question from this building uses the mic. So if you just hold your question, you'll be first here. Okay, thank you. Dylan, thank you. Talk about digging deeper. <laughs> uh, would you show your appreciation for the work? <laughs> the title of this uh, presentation, Di uh, Digging Deeper, that was something that Sarah came up with. Um, and by another incredible coincidence, it's the name of a series that I've been producing for EPCOR for the last, um, I started interviews six and a half months ago, um, studying history and archeology span in the North Saskatchewan River Valley and hopefully bringing uh, more of these stories to light. But the, it's, uh, you know, it's just a fluke that, um, that Sarah came up with the, the same name. I guess great minds think alike. Serendipity. Um, so just before we go to questions, uh, if you want to take your beverage or have a cookie now, this would be a good time, but we would like to ask uh, Chief Darlene Missick to come up. Uh, she has a special presentation. Uh, hi, Dylan. So on behalf of our nation, uh, we'd like to present you with a token of our appreciation for all of the hard work that you've been doing on behalf of the Indigenous peoples in this area. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Gerald Delorme, who is present as well. He's from a, uh, 
and what's called the Empton stragglers, even though we weren't talking about that in this presentation. Uh, there, is, there are a lot of issues that are outstanding that you can dig deeper into. So what we've done here is we've talked about the reserve that was uh, designated under treaty as a treaty land promise to the Papa's Chase community of peoples. So I'd like to present this to you, Dylan. Um, perhaps I could make my way up. <laughs> I wanted something a little bit better than just fridge magnets for Dylan. So um, here's, a, here's a beaded necklace. It's in peyote stitch, and it has your name on it. And so if you have to go to an orange shirt day or if you have lacking a, a name tag or whatever, just know that uh, an Indigenous community has given this to you. It's not tied in with the Papa's Chase specifically, but we'd like you to have it. Thank you. <laughs> So finally, uh, to some questions, uh, we, were, we are having questions both from this building and from the online uh, viewers as well. So be patient with us while we deal with the challenges of this. The uh, questions are all here in a mic, into a mic as a gesture of respect for folks who are hearing challenged in the room and for online viewers who want to hear as well. And. Uh, for folks who are online, uh, you can signal with that lovely hands up reaction button that is available to all online viewers, or you can type your questions into the chat. And Jacqueline will bring the, the microphone to our first question. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Should I stop sharing my screen? Okay, my question has, and you alluded it already to a bit. What I want to find out is when and who identified a group called Edmonton Stranglers. It sounds like a, a, a very negative term. And if you could elaborate a bit, or, or the guests here as well, whoever knows more about it. Well, I think it would probably be, uh, you know, that's the kind of question that um, that I should deflect to Gerald. Uh, I know that the stragglers were a category created by the Dominion government that was very inconvenient to them. They want the Dominion government wanted people to take treaty and move to a reserve, or they wanted them to take script and de declare themselves as Métis. The stragglers were an independent category that existed outside of that, as Gerald has said, uh, did not follow a specific chief and um and we're all mo in the for the most part already established outside of the reserves but i'm going to turn that one over to gerald the term stragglers came from the our research have said that the, the stragglers is an old term it wasn't just made in this area i i, I dated it back to at least this early 1700s because you weren't part of the major major band so let's say you had your family right and you're out hunting is oh you're one of the you're a straggler from this certain area right so th this idea that the band was just made from the government for this area it's not that's not accurate because they've had stragglers all along the uh as he came west from different areas of bands so it's just the terminology that uh even though like i said the empton stragglers knew who their chiefs were and the chiefs that were that came here, they knew that they were they were not recognized as chiefs. So the women says, no, we don't want nothing to do with these people. Not so much the, they'll intermix, but they're not our chiefs. You're not my father, sort of thing, right? Or you're not my you're not my leader. So this is where the term M Stragglers is. And the women were the, the power. And this is where this is why you have a lot of missing women and children today from the from what's going on here, because the women are the title holders and the power. And this is where they were putting a lot of these people on these bands and disposing of them through genocide. Matrial, we are a matriarchal society. Thank you. Also, 
this taps into what um, Dylan had pointed out earlier with regards to identity. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, there's so many levels to this, and I call it cultural genocide that happened to our people. Uh, we think we're Métis sometimes. We think we're treaty. We don't know, because of the Indian Act and the application of the Indian Act, again, it's like the land grid system that was applied to the land. That same kind of control was applied to our Indigenous peoples, fitting them into square boxes. And you have this very derogatory term for the Edmonton stragglers. These are Indigenous peoples. These were peoples that, were, this was their traditional territory. So when we talk about identity and, and labels, uh, we're just trying to fit a, a, square, a, pay, a square peg or a round peg into a square hole or vice versa. It's so difficult to, to uh, conceptualize the, the, the level of, 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 of genocide that took place. Uh, we have a lot of our people that came from broken treaty promises uh, that ended up living as road allowance people. And as a result, uh, the province of Alberta put in survival communities for them, which we call the Métis settlements. Now, the term Métis is again a very, um, it, it, there's getting to be more definition applied to that term. But as we go and apply that term to people, uh, it, the first element of that test is self-identification. So um, the first element of that is is do you self-identify as Métis? And that's work that's been done by the Métis people. Now, uh, a lot of people, uh, even ourselves, we, we're forging our identities. We come from broken treaty promises. Uh, we're registered as Indians because of the Indian Act. Uh, so we become status Indians. Uh, but, the ter but these terms, we, have to, we need to be uh, defining ourselves and we have to have we have to show understanding and empathy towards each other in this process because this isn't about jurisdiction. We can't, we, do, we can't have colonial ways of thinking about these things, but we also need we need to know who we are, and and this is something that because of the Indian Act, so many things have happened. Um, the loss of identity because uh, a, a woman married out of the out of out of the Indian Act, uh, the uh, the uh, forced. Uh, uh, the, the forced schooling of our children in residential schools, uh, the loss of your identity if you, be, if you became a professional. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. And what happened with the Papa's Chase people who did take treaty, were on the treaty pay list, they, they, there was a provision that was put in the Indian Act that said that if uh, they wished to, uh, if they were half breeds, okay, there's another term, uh, who took treaty, then they could take this script. So this wasn't Dominion Act le uh, legislation, this wasn't Dominion Act script. And so because of the circumstances at that time in this area where you couldn't leave the reserve, they had to go hunt, you couldn't do anything without the consent of the administrator of that reserve under the Indian Act, um, we were facing starvation. And that's in our families, that those histories are there. And, uh, and in particular with your grandfather, he shares those stories, Jerry Quinn. So we, we have a, a history of, uh, uh, of where we lived in the face of no agreement. So the treaty promises such as cows and plows, um, the assistance with agriculture, uh, all of these provisions which were supposed to um, be a mutual partnership were not upheld by Canada. So our agreements were with the Crown, the treaty and Canada did not uphold those promises through their legislation that they put in place to administer these reserves in this treaty. And so the, uh, we have an argument in the federal court uh, that we are seeking a declaration that it was a breach of the honor of the crown to include the treaty, the minor treaty children in that script taking of their parents. And when you look at the circumstances that were surrounding those people on that reserve, which I will speak to when I do my presentation in April, uh, those uh, circumstances would compel a whole lot of us to do what they did. Um, but uh, Canada is in breach of the honor of the crown, and that's where we come from. So. Uh, it's on, okay. I wanted to say, bring, touch up on what Dar uh, Chief Misik was saying when we're trying to self identify as a people, like we're the only race of people that have to carry a card to prove that we are who we say we are. Mm -hmm. And I didn't become treaty until I was in my 40s. And before then, I couldn't even say I was native. 
I wasn't allowed to say it because I didn't have a card that said I was. So, I mean, it's a messed up system with INAC. I've read that book twice and it pisses me off every time because we, we are still classified as property, as cattle, you know, basically in that, that document. And it just, it annoys me to no end, you know? So like, like Dylan said, like, uh, I am proud of my heritage being a direct descendant to Chief Papa's chase, but it's not without its struggles along the way. And thank God for Chief Mystic and all the work she's done. And, but it's, it's hasn't been easy along the way to try and prove who you are to say that like, and I am thankful that we're all here together. So to try and learn from all of this, you know, I'm not here to gain anybody's sympathy. Hell no. Like uh, we've already been through the ringer many times already. So, but I just wanted to brush up on that, you know, that being identified now as a treaty person and I'm very proud of my lineage and Dylan, I don't know, like, if I want to mention this, but it's just, I'm kind of an anomaly. Like, I, I found this out not too long ago, and Dylan was the one that noticed something when I was doing my genealogy, that I am from Chief Papas Chase, who's a Treaty 6 signer, but Chief Kachikawam, who also signed the same treaty, August 21st, 1877, is also my great-great-grandfather. That's on my mom's side. So both my, I come from two treaty six signers that signed the same treaty the same day, the same year. I, I didn't know that until Dylan told me, he's like, wow, you have quite the double stream, <laughs> I think is what he said. And yes, Chief Katsikam, that's Alexander Reserve. He was my great, great grandfather as well. So I, uh, that is interesting. I'm very proud of that, you know, like, and, but when I told my family about that, they were just like, really, like two Treaty 6 signers? I mean, one guy said, do you know how to special wear? Like, I'm not, I'm not special at all. I'm just, that's just my blood, my lineage. I, I'm just a long line of, uh, of important people, I think. And, but I'm very proud of that. And, but uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah. Our next, thank you very much, by the way. Our next question is from someone who is online. I believe it's Janice McGregor. She, oh, she's typed out her question in the chat. Oh, it's, oh. with all of the history of the Papas Chase and other Indigenous in the Edmonton area, how do we recognize and acknowledge their contributions within the current naming and communities developed through land claims and settlements of the Dominion Land Act. In other words, most Edmontonians do not recognize nor understand the history of the land we live on. Yeah, I think that's more of a comment than a question. Thank you. You know, I pointed out this, this idea that we have these neighborhoods that are named after the first people to receive patent and sometimes incorrectly like Robert McKernan and, and Robert Lendrum. And I think that moving forwards, you know, I think it's a great, uh, a great tragedy that we moved over to the numbering system because there was a lot of our early history built into the original naming of streets. Um, and I think moving forwards, you know, we have, uh, I, I didn't point out, but in the, in the subdivision of neighborhoods, what used to be the Papas Chase Reserve, there is a little industrial area now called Papas Chase, but I think that was, that was very much down, um, down the line that that was named as an afterthought. Uh, if we look at where um, Bateau farmed, originally it was in the vicinity of L.Y. Cairns School, and then um, after the creation of the reserve, he established a farm in what's now Steinhauer. And we at least, we have some mentioned some references to Indigenous history in the names of neighborhoods like Blue Quill and Steinhauer and um, Ermanskin and, and others, but they're, you know, the, they're not naming the, the generally not acknowledging uh, the people who actually lived here. And that goes for the families outside of the reserves as well. Like you could call Allendale, Ward and Kipling, you could call Aspen Gardens, Vandal, you could call 
um, Westbrook Estates, Whitford, like just the, the, and, and whether that is anything like that happens or not, I think it's important to just recognize that there are older stories that didn't start with subdivision of town lots in 1967. We're coming very close to the uh, conclusion of our time together um, as a hybrid gathering. And so I'd just like to make a few other comments and then we will close it down. But I don't think we're going anywhere, those of us who still have questions. So, <laughs> um, if you found this session worthwhile, um, we'd ask you to kindly um, consider defraying costs. We have a, a red bowl at the front. And if you can uh, leave a, a donation, that would be quite wonderful. Um, or you can donate online at Westwood's website, westwoodunitarian.ca. Uh, we also have some flyers in the basket. So if you found this an interesting presentation and have to have others to share it with, just take a flyer with you uh, and share with them. And as you've heard a number of times this afternoon, our April session features Chief Darlene Missick and members of her First Nation. So this conversation who has just barely gotten started here is going to go down to the roots the next time we meet. And then there's a final session that is on April 16th and the final session is on June 2nd, and that is Miranda Jimmy talking about uh, uh, recultivating connection. So that whole land uh, theme goes straight through our three presentations. Thank you very much for coming, um, and especially to Dylan. That's an amazing piece of work. Thank you. Um, i just say that if, if you can, I, I can't monitor chat while I'm talking, but if, if there are any questions that you'd like to forward to me, I can do my best to try to answer them through you. Great, thank you. So people who want to hang around, hang around, have another coffee, have another tea. Folks who are ready to go, thank you for coming. <laughs>